Welcome to Talks at Google. I'm Jason Andreas. I'm based out of the Detroit office here. I know a lot of you guys traveled in, so we appreciate that. I'm here with the Avet brothers. Uh, very excited to have them here in our office. Um, we're going to kind of kick things off here with a couple questions. Uh, we'll do a little audience Q&A, and then they're going to play some music for us. So we're very excited about that. So let's give them another round of applause, and we'll get started. Thank you very much. Thanks, so I just wanted to start. You guys are obviously on tour right now, two nights in a row in Detroit. Thank you for showing Detroit some love on the tour. Uh, I was kind of digging into the tour you guys have been on. I feel like you guys have been on tour forever now. Uh, since the new album came out, you kicked things off in Madison Square Garden, which is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, you did three nights in Chicago, three nights at Red Rocks. You did a little stint in Europe. Uh, you're in Detroit, like I said. And I want to hear more about this, too. Five nights on the beach in Mexico to wrap things off. Yeah, coming up. That sounds pretty awesome. Uh, I know you guys all have families. Uh, how do you guys balance all of this? How do you guys spend so much time on the road playing music, meeting fans, coming to Google with the family life you guys all have at home. Uh, obviously, we're, we're still figuring that out. Uh, I think we try to, try to keep our minds open for revision and uh, to be able to revise it constantly. Um, if you would have asked us this question 10 years ago, it would have been a totally different answer because we... You know, we had home lives, but we pretty much abandoned them to do this. And now that's not really an option. We don't want it to be an option. So we're always kind of looking at how, how can we craft the year to where we are contributing in both, in both realms, you know. Um, all of our family situations are very different, but we're, we're all kind of pulled in, in these two very uh, powerful directions. But um, I don't know how, how to, I mean... It's always, it's always something that we're trying to figure out. And we all have uh, episodes where we don't feel like we have it figured out at all, you know. Sure. But, I mean, that could happen in any job, yeah. really. You know, I mean, if, if, you're, at, if you're at home always and you're, and you're, you're working a, a more conventional schedule, you might still not see. If you have, a, like, a young child, you might still not see him hardly ever. So, I don't know. I don't think it's that unique to what we do, but uh, we're still trying to figure it out. But we, we do pretty well, and we have very supportive families, so it makes it easier. That's great. Physically, we try to we try to make it home as much as possible. Not like Seth saying mentally, we kind of we sort of stay there mentally and stay in the game there all the time. But uh, this is a good example where we were home for three. We didn't have to go home, but we were home for three days earlier this week. When we finish in Grand Rapids uh, in a couple of days, we're going to go home for 36 hours and then come back up to Akron. But it's like that that determination and that discipline is by choice. We don't, and it sort of throws you out of the work game, which is kind of something you got to work against as far as the current of being, um, uh, being in, the, in the game, in the creative space in your head. Um, and another, one other physical thing about that is we actually are benefits to our families for going away. We come back as better fathers um, and better husbands by going out. Uh, Europe is a good example where if all we did was stay in one place, anywhere in the, you could name anywhere in the country, if all we did was stay in one place and watch the news and go back home, and go to work. If, if we didn't allow ourselves to expand, um, we wouldn't be able to come home and speak on things in a face-to-face, -face, uh, real-life term, like going to London and realizing, okay, you don't have to be. Uh, London is, is, is great, and it's not scary, because I just saw someone got hurt on the tube you know, the other day, so you get, you get fear, and we see that growing, um, and we get to see it firsthand, and bring it back to our kids and be able to tell them, no, go. Go. This is a great home life, but go, and and you can come back always. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, speaking of family life, it, it's a a pretty big role in most of your albums. Most of the songwriting you guys have done over the past two or three albums, since you guys have all started to develop families, um, there's a lot of common themes, especially in true sadness. Things like spirituality, personal trials, uh, fate, redemption. You guys have a lot of things going on at any given time. You guys are struggling with the the fact that you have families at home, kids, wives, as you were mentioning, plus this time on the road. Do you ever second guess? as an artist writing these types of things into songs and, and giving them to all of us being too personal, getting too personal into your lives and sharing that out? Or is that just, is that where the inspiration truly comes from? Well, we haven't been, been punished for it yet. Really. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, all, all we found is that we, 
we are rewarded for it in a way, which is not why we do it. But I mean, having people say that they are connecting to these songs, it means a lot. And we're the ones that have to sing them, you know, like we're, whatever we put out there, those are the songs that are most likely to be played multiple, multiple, multiple times in our lives. So we think of it as, um, you know, if I'm going to play this, if I'm going to play this song 5,000 more times, let's say this band goes on for 20 more years or however long it goes on. If I play the song thousands of more times, I really need to believe it. It can't really be about something that's fleeting, really. Yeah, it can't, it can't be about the dance floor. You know, it can't, it, it just can't because like, like for the audience that, that comes out and sees us, it's, it maybe is one night or maybe a few nights out of the year that they, they take the time to come and see us. But every night we're singing these songs. So they, they can't be, um, they can't be too topical. They don't all need to be like so heavy, um, but, but they need to be real and they, they need to, to be based in reality for us and based in the, the narrative of our lives um, because we have to be behind them. So it's, it hasn't been a problem yet. It's, it's only been good. Yeah. Well, there's a lot more emotion in a song about something like divorce versus the dance floor, right? <laughs> you know well, what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. We write about what's, what's going on in our lives, and, uh, you know, the dance floor isn't really going on in our lives so much. <laughs> so uh, I don't yeah. believe it. <laughs> yeah. yeah there's nothing wrong with the dance floor. The dance floor is wonderful. Yeah, sure. the dance floor is wonderful. Sure. You know. Well, that kind of moves us into the new album, right? So we're talking about emotion, the, the album's titled True Sadness. I guess I, I say it's new. We talked about this out in the lobby. It's, it's not necessarily as new anymore. It's the newest album. We talk about the album. It's called True Sadness. Can you talk about some of, of the concepts or the concept of true sadness and, and why that was the name of this album, why that's the title track on this album, um, and kind of dive into that a little bit more. Yeah, I think all three of us should actually speak on that because Bob summarized well whenever we were sort of struggling. Seth and I had, which makes up the dichotomy or the, the contrast in this band, Seth and I sort of split it down the middle a lot of times, even though we're, uh, we're together more than we're apart on things. But uh, um, Bob does a good job of summarizing and, and took it to another level. You're talking about true sadness and the title sure. of it. Sure, when, when uh, Scott and Seth said, we think the album should be titled True Sadness, uh, and I started thinking about that and what that meant kind of in my personal life, having a daughter who had cancer and a um, special needs child and uh, facing the very real possibility of, of losing her at 20, 22 months old and the possibility that her cancer will always come back. Um, there's a, at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, there's kind of a, a few sayings, like it's the best worst place in the world is one of them. And you see a poster uh, down a hallway that says, uh, that was actually, uh, they, there's a hallway in the hospital that's the, it's the children's kind of art museum. So a lot of these teenage patients, they, they create art and they hang them in this hallway. And I remember one of them, uh, a girl, painted this beautiful painting and said, you have to dance in the rain. And it's kind of this idea that we all walk through our lives and we are constantly burdened by woe and uh, sadness and heavy things going on to the people that we love, to ourselves. But somehow, through that, through the, the, the tragedy that we all face, um, our hearts are big enough to equally have joy. You know, the human heart is big enough that you can have experienced tremendous pain and sadness, but at the same time, you are capable of recognizing and kind of basking in pure joy and celebrating that. And that's like the richness of our lives is this, is this tension between despair and, and just peace and joy. And so that's what true sadness, the, ch the title means to me, and that's what the, con the concept is. It's kind of like not hiding from either, not, not hiding from, from the pain and, and, the, and the utter despair. Uh, so you're locked away and you can't recognize the sunshine and, and the beauty. And that's what it means to me. Um, you guys worked on this album in particular the last three also with with the the iconic rick rubin right uh he's been uh he, the 
kind of a mentor to you guys on on kind of the songwriting process you guys obviously developed that yourselves but he helped you kind of take it a little bit further and these albums show that they've been incredible can you talk a little bit about the process of working with a guy like rick and and what he brought out of you what his process is and, and how that kind of molded with what you guys were already doing yourselves sure he uh the first thing he did for us was um created space for us uh this is a nice thing to be able to say, but it's it's true. He said, uh, he, he, our philosophy is no deadlines, no budget, because creatively, there's nothing that squashes something great like a deadline or a budget, nothing. And as soon as someone tells you, you've got this, this work has got to be done by so-and-so. So what, what Rick did instantly was like, slow down, and the, the label will get the record when we're done, period. And so we we had, for whatever it was worth all the time, and we weren't used to working that way because we were always hand to mouth. And uh, we knew that the only way, and still the only way that we can make a living is to go out and play shows. We never sold records. We never had any radio uh, uh, presence. Um, and so he helped create space to say, just slow down, let's make the great, no matter what, whatever comes out of, the, um, out of us will be great, period. And we can't do that unless we create this bubble uh, that we can live in without time and without budget. So that was uh, that was key. And then he, I think he's a, a great uh, advocate of um, reminding us who we are. And whenever we start to like, maybe you know how each day you get you get tired or, or hungry and you start doing things that are un you. <laughs> you know, I, I I know I do it. I go home and just treat everybody. I, I tend to get kind of like mean. Uh, and sort of like a you know snake. You know the road makes us better fathers. Uh, better, better. Fathers. Yeah, 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 home, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I go home and I'm like, yeah, stop, just, just leave me alone for a second. Jerk uh, to everybody. But our group also will make calls. I think once we're fatigued and stretched thin, and I think he's always been good about, you know, don't be afraid for just the three or four of you to step up. And this doesn't have to be the whole band. Bring it back down. Let it be because songs are they're the heart of this. They're the heart of it. They could be in any genre. Any song that we've ever written could be redone in any genre that's out there, period. But the point is, is songs are the key, and he would remind us, just get it back to the song. That's, that's great. I mean, there's a lot of things that he does for and with us. Uh, to, to wrap up, when we met Rick and, and uh, acknowledged and realized our friendship, we, we really we identified a, just a, an ally that we, we didn't know before. He didn't know in us. And... Uh, it was it was a beautiful thing, and it's just grown just like it should. There's no uh, no strain in that at all. I think I heard you mention in another interview that he had you guys create four versions of the same song for this album in different formats, different kind of mixes. Um, how did you end up deciding on the ones that make the album? Right, because all four have their distinct kind of feels. Why do you why do you pick one over the other? And and what happens to the other three? Are they in a vault well, somewhere? Do they ever come out live? We what just do you picked, guys do with them? We just picked the one that we were least sick of. That's basically <laughs> what it came down to. I've heard this song 500 times. <laughs> this rendition is not making me nauseous, so I'll uh, go with that. I don't know. It, it, I mean, like Scott's saying, like uh, all of our songs, I mean, can be presented in different ways. I always think about this. Um, Louis Armstrong did this Hank Williams song, and it was just a Louis Armstrong song, you know? And it was it spoke to the quality of the song, you know, like um, like Hank Williams didn't just write country songs, you know, he wrote great songs, so they can be presented in a kind of in a multitude of ways. But um, it, it was just a, a process of of that search, looking for the best the best way, the best spirit, and the best aesthetic to uh, to serve the themes. And uh, for some songs, that takes more experimenting than others, you know. And Rick is big on the experiment. He loves the experiment. He's big on, you know, let's find out if this is a horrible idea. And he'll say that. He'll be like, I've, I've got an idea, and it might be terrible. That's how, that's how he'll introduce an idea a lot of times. Um, but we have sort of garnered and, and grown this, uh, this bad habit of, of thinking that we know what, a, um, what the outcome is going to be without trying it. And that happens, like, in our lives and, and, and in, in songs. You know, you just, you know, whatever. Like, you could like, look at one of these these framed uh, pictures here on the wall and be like, well, you know, the one with the Porsche and the kind of olive green background and think, well, what would that be like if the background was like tie-dye? 
and then and then making a call on that before you put the time in to make a tie-dye background, you know. But there, you can't really know what that's going to look like until you put that time in and make the tie-dye background. So, like in songs, that's happening all the time. It'll be like, you know, she would do the chorus twice, and before Rick would be like, one of us would just be like, nah, that's going to suck. You know, well, let's not do that. But now it's like, well, let's let's actually play the chorus twice and see what that feels like. So, um, I don't even know what the question was. Oh, we uh, <laughs> we we. Uh, I, th I think that it was clear once we had finished the process, the four versions, by the way, were like a demo type version where we basically pretended that it was 2005 and it was just me and Scott and Bob. So we did two full days of doing all the songs, just banjo, guitar, bass, two vocals. And then we did it as if we were the band, like in the 70s and did uh, the whole seven piece band, vocals at the same time, did the whole thing. And then a second engineer in the backyard uh, in this little tiny little studio in the backyard of, of the studio we we're working at, uh, did total reimaginations of every song uh, where the only original track was the vocal. So it became different different uh, tempo, different rhythm, uh, like synthetic type instruments, drum machines, all these all these different uh, elements to, to reimagine them. And then as a fourth version, we would replace the synthetic tracks with our own performances. So after we did all that, it was a bit exhausted, and then we just took some time, and then came back to it and reviewed it, and it was really clear which ones really, really worked the best. How long does that entire process take? Uh, it took uh, <clears throat> 22 years for us to. Uh, it's before most of us in this room were born. That's so right. It's impressive. Yeah. That's it. No, I, I can't remember. I mean, how long did it take? I have no idea at this point. Fall of 2014. So it took. I mean, it took roughly a year. About a year. And a couple months yeah. To, yeah. to give us time to listen and live. We, we get them, we get these mixes and we drive around, we drive our kids to schools and we're listening to these records and these uh, different versions and then we're going and overdubbing and uh, so yeah, and that's that. That's where that no deadline uh, theory comes in sure. to play because we're able to make it and when it's finished then it's, then it's time for a deadline. Hey Seth, you mentioned the studio, you guys, did you record the majority of this at Shangri-La, is that correct? We did, yeah, yeah. The majority. I, and I'm a huge fan of the band, the 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 group, the band from the '70s, '80s. Um, did you find inspiration? Is that something that have you recorded in that studio before? Did Rick bring you to that studio to find inspiration? You mentioned even recording in their style with the full the full band, kind of all in the same place at one time. Is that part of the process as well? It, it well, I mean, it, it adds to it. It helps. It doesn't hurt at all to walk up the sidewalk and see where the band had. Uh, put in a little uh, engraving in the, awesome. in the sidewalk. It's very nice. The cool thing is, is we did the overdubs at this place in uh, North Carolina where uh, Mitch Easter, who produced R.E.M.'s Reckoning and Murmur. Yeah, the first two albums. The first two albums. So that was where the the last version of the songs was added to. So there's, you know, adding to that, like after we'd done the synthetic sort yeah. of electronic versions, going into that just for a little bit, but it still was just added to those layers. But Shangri-La is... is um, you know, it's it's home for us. Yeah. Uh, it's very e very easy to uh, cancel out all your surroundings. There's no distractions. That's great. Um, real quick, you know, we're at Google, obviously. Uh, Seth, when when you uh, released the album True Sadness, you you penned a long letter on your site, your website, to your fans. You guys have a very strong interaction uh, with your fans. A lot of that is based on technology. Uh, I'm just curious how you guys, do you, do you guys like technology? Do you hate technology? Does it make your lives easier or worse? Uh, I'd love to just kind of understand how you utilize technology to, to connect with fans, to, to stay in touch with family, things like that. Helps us understand and inspires us a little bit. Oh, man, that's that's quite a question. <laughs> um, I don't know. It. I mean, asking me today with everything that's been happening in the world recently, I, I don't know. I, I stay away from it a fair amount. Yeah. Uh, there's so many voices. There's just so many voices, and there's just so many people just talking and talking and talking and talking and talking, and you just yeah. you get to a point where you just don't want to hear people talking. It gets you know? exhausting, right? Yeah, yeah, just so many, just just so many opinions and reactions piling atop each other, and and um, it's hard to to separate out quality conversation from uh, from static. And there's just um, there's so much static, and we def we definitely use technology. Um, because we're we are away from home a lot, so we certainly do the. I mean, FaceTime is like a. It's just a blessing, you know. It's an incredible blessing to see my little, eighteen months old son and see hey, we can talk to each other. I mean, it's just it's incredible. It's incredible. It's. I mean, there are great blessings in it, but I feel like for me personally, I have to kind of keep my my hand on the pulse of of what it's doing for me and how much it's kind of getting in the way. Because generally speaking, I, I'm I'm trying to get away from it more than I'm trying to embrace it. Sure. I mean, does anyone else want to? Well, I mean, that being said, 
when we we we're an interesting case because we started Bob and Seth and I were together in 2001 and we were burning our own CDs you know we were selling them out of a suitcase uh, I was answering as many emails as possible we all were like ev every single one of them and, and having personal there's still personal relationships that that came from that time uh, so we watched you know MySpace came along and that was an instant you know tool for us it worked worked well and we still you know we're very active uh, uh, we should be more active um, but we're products of that shift. We've watched that shift, and we're definitely, I underestimate, I, I don't tweet enough, but when I do, I can't believe how many people, like, they speak to it like it's, you know, it, it's real. I mean, and it is, and I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't disrespect that. Like, I think at first I sort of took, made light of it, but I think it's real. One thing that I, uh, I think happens, what Seth's speaking to and what I, I feel like sometimes is that there's an umbrella of global interaction that stomps the here and now. It just destroys the here and now and, and the, the, the many, many local vibes that you want to feel. So the local communities on the web, I wonder what happens, like physically local communities that are linked. If that even exists, I don't even know. But I'm just so, like, I think we just get bombarded with so much global mm -hmm. that all of a sudden, you can't live in in Detroit. You're, you're actually your head is in is in uh, uh, Singapore for whatever's going. You know, you need to be informed, but all of a sudden you've spent days thinking about what's going on in across the the globe. Sure. There's a there's a level of that needs to happen. But yeah, and I, I want one last thing. Uh, I have the great luxury to not be so involved in it if I if I choose not to be. Joe Kwan down here, very tech savvy. He takes care of a lot of our social. Um, I don't even know what's called social media outlets or whatever. I think that's it, yeah. So it's very nice for me that I can be like, you know, I, I try to stay away from it. But, you know, as a band, like any band, we it is a it is a great tool and it is a way to stay connected. Um, and we're very fortunate to have sort of a head of that department uh, in in, uh, in Joe Kwan. But Bobby, you were uh, yeah, basically we don't know what we're talking about. Yeah, we're <laughs> yeah, Joe is the only person that knows what we're talking, what yeah. social media is. He, he really... Um, helps he fills that role for us he helps us stay connected to our fans so many positive things about it right i have an app on my phone that my kids teachers upload pictures and videos throughout the day and give little they can send me a direct message hey sam had a tough day on the playground or or, or i can see what they're working on in school so then when they come home i can reinforce that um, the first time i used the internet was to book our first tour in 2002 that was the first time I used the internet. But the, what I've noticed, especially th through the, this election cycle is, we are social media, Twitter and Facebook, we're kind of getting in this mode of reacting rather than responding. So somebody posts something and there's a visceral reaction and there's this like almost knee jerk to, to answer it or to, to react to it in some way, be it positive or negative. And what we're not allowing ourselves or we're training ourselves not to do is take time, take in what this person is saying, what this news story means, and then respond to it thoughtfully. And it's so, how many times in our lives has someone said something to us and we either Im immediately snap back, yeah. either we say something back to them that's, th and then later in the day we're like, why did I say that to Joe? He didn't deserve that. You didn't deserve that, Joe. <laughs> Scott yeah. mostly, <laughs> but but no, it's like th that's that that is something that I think we have this moment after the election, bruised feelings, whatever. We need to take a minute with the social media and just say, am I reacting or am I responding? And and allow ourselves some time to process it. And maybe everybody needs to take a walk in the woods. So, I just want to add. I want to add one thing. Um, uh, going back to the question of the kind of the role that technology plays in our life, I, I would say on tour, um, I am a lot more in touch with technology because I always have this and my other phone in my hand. I'm always looking for our photographer to take pictures and he'll post those photos. And then I'm checking up on the news. What are the fans saying? Oh, my God, I can't believe this happened. We have to reply. We have to reach out to these people. I go home. And then all of a sudden, both of my phones are sitting on the table, and four hours goes by. 
and I have about 20 texts from our manager saying, Joe, we need a response on this to get it out social media, and I've just completely forgotten about it. Um, and I think that just kind of is the role that happens when you are engrossed in it, having to be in constant contact, and then being able to take a step away when you get home to take a breath away and say, oh, man, I don't, I don't need to do that right now. Um, and most things are not you know, so critical that you need to respond in 30 minutes. Uh, th that's something that I've noticed. I don't know about the rest of the guys. I just know that on the road, I'm like technology 100,000%. At home, I'm like, uh, I'm going to make some stew before I do anything. <laughs> you know? But you know this guy's yeah. advanced because he's walking around two phones. <laughs> <laughs> Straight away. Well, awesome. He's pared down to only two. <laughs> I kind of think that there's going to be a, a younger generation that really key on, on how to regulate this for themselves. Like, I, I think there's going to be a backlash that's really healthy. Seth and I already, and I, we, you're speaking to it right now, Joe, is like we have started taking hours in the day. We, don't, we might tell each other, we might not, where it's like I'm off, the, I'm off the clock. The phone is just at least at the bar. I mean, things like that in a household with a family. Sure. All the phones stay on the bar or at the, ca at at the, the counter. Bar. I have one, yeah. you get your, when you get your shot, whatever your choice, then you, you leave the phone there. Uh, yeah, the Irish car is whatever. But, um, but I think there's going to be like some, some younger generations that are really savvy as far as understanding how to. I think that's going to be part of health. Like, you know, uh, uh, hopefully, I don't know how you would mandate that. I feel like it's going to just naturally take care of itself. I have faith in that. Why don't we, uh, we, we want to hear you guys play some music, obviously. Why don't we turn it over to maybe one or two questions from the audience, uh, and then we can kind of transition from there. Sure. Anyone have an initial question? Sure. And, and I'll repeat it so they're not mic'd up, so just let me repeat the question so we have it on the audio. Hi. Hey. Thank mm -hmm. you for having us. Yeah, so the question was just spirituality plays a big role, obviously, in a lot of the lyrics that you guys wrote. Can you or write? Can you elaborate a little bit more on that for us? Sure. Um, the lyrics are written by Seth and I. Uh, our grandfather was a Methodist minister uh, in the South in, from the 40s through the 70s. Um, he had death threats from the KKK. He uh, was a Martin Luther King and Gandhi uh, supporter and spoke on them. He was progressive. If you read his sermons, in today's terms, he would be, you know, I, I don't know that he would be as progressive, but for the times was just uh, very, very uh, progressive and amazing and loving. And I, I think of him as a, as a, a blue-collar intellect. He was a champion for the blue-collar and spirituality in general. Um, Seth and I, and Bob and Joe as well. Uh, Bob's, I mean, excuse me, Joe's father was actually a Methodist minister as well. Um, we all have ideas about it, but we all have strong spiritual ties and a belief that at the end of the day, when we lay down, no matter what, if it's in a nice bed or if it's on the street, that it's between us and something much bigger. And that's how the end of our life will be, us and that. And um, Bob and I were just speaking on the, on the uh, bus uh, all the things that happen politically and, and emotionally here on this planet is a ceiling on it. Uh, there's something beyond that that uh, none of us will ever understand. And we just, we, uh, I think we have faith that there's something much bigger that we have to respect and um, acknowledge. I, I don't know that we can say we know. <laughs> we don't know for anybody else. And at the end of the day, we know for ourselves individually. That's what we have to, we have to um rely on. I do think that through that, people can unite uh, through, through their love and through um, a belief in something that's bigger. It doesn't have to be defined in the same way. It doesn't have to be the same name or articulated the same way. Nobody's going to articulate it the same way. Within the Christian community, people articulate it completely different, and that's okay. Yeah, I, th I think what you're hearing in our songs is just... Um, another form of the conversation that we're having like you i mean you might be amazed at some of the conversations we have after our shows we get on in the front of the bus and us four man we we sit down and we get into some 
we get into some really in-depth conversations and a lot of time uh, a lot of the time it is about providence about about god and um so we don't we're not uh with the songs we're not standing at we're not standing in the pulpit we're not standing at, at any kind of podium with um with all the answers but i, I think that um once again if, if if i'm writing a song about divorce it's just something that i'm experiencing and i'm processing and trying to figure it out and uh when we mention god in our songs it, it it's part it's just part of the conversation we're just kind of working through it and and we have the great honor of being able to work through it a little bit with an outlet and and with an audience as well I mean, I've got a lot of thoughts about it. I've got some conflict about it. Um, but it's certainly not a viable option anymore for an artist to um, to make any kind of living on recorded music as far as releasing albums. That's a part of the past. That, that doesn't exist anymore. Um, I heard an alarming statistic about that Pharrell song, Happy. Uh, it was like the most successful song in a 12 month 12 month period or whatever and it had so many millions of of uh, of listens st uh, streamed and i think he got a check for like $2200 or something like that so you can imagine what that would be for for anything less than happy which was a gigantic hit you know um but you know in a way the thing that has always worked is still working like if you go back to mozart he was able to make a living from touring you know he i mean the surefire way is to connect with people in a way, and I think Scott's articulated this well, in a way, you know, the albums are still a, for us, a, um, an, uh, an outpouring of, of, uh, of our thoughts and our feelings and, and our stories. The artistry is there, but if you're looking at it from uh, like a, I don't know, a commerce standpoint, it's just fuel for the fire, really. I mean, they, they, the albums end up amounting to, like in a business model, they, they amount to like a commercial for, for what we're doing live. You know, there's not, there's not a way to actually make money on that, but but that's all right. I mean, we 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 built this project on connecting with people in in venues, so um, it doesn't really hurt us so much. No, and uh, Amanda Palmer's TED Talk is pretty great about that. If you watch her TED Talk, uh, it's like 15 minutes long. It's it's brilliant. And she she's going back to busking. She talks kind of about busking and getting pe letting people pay. Her whole message is let people pay for music instead of figure out ways to make them pay for music, and that they will. They will pay for it. I, I agree with everything Seth says right there. I, um, but that starts at a certain level. If you're a street performer and you're not on iTunes and you've got a group of people that you make enough noise that people want to see it, if you had a USB drive or a CD, people will actually buy it. There still are outlets that way, and there's, there's a lot of sort of uh, individual ways that you can... You can rise from that and you can sell because we did CDs back in the day when we were traveling from, it was four of us counting our tour manager and the three of us, we did make a, a little extra money selling CDs. That was one of the key components. It was t-shirts, the show and CDs. And it was, uh, it was um, uh, relevant. But then once you get to a certain level and you're keyed in into a commercial, you know, especially working with a major label, it's just, it's, uh, it's just reinforcing the fact that we're here to, to have an experience with people. That's that's what we are. We're not, we're not record uh, makers and hit makers and trying to. That's that's a market. That's a different thing. Cool. I got one last question, and then we'll have you guys play a little bit of music if that's cool. So, uh, you guys mentioned politics a few times. I wasn't sure if I was going to ask this question, but uh, I will. Oh, yeah. You've got. Uh, <clears throat> you wrote a song in '09 called uh, Head Full of Doubt, Road Full of Promise, and there's a lyric in there that goes, when nothing is owned, owed or deserved or expected, your life doesn't change by the man that's elected. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's very, uh, it, it, it strikes a chord uh, with all that's been going on over the past few sure. months and, and what happened this week. Does that still hold true for you guys, that type of lyric? Yes. I mean, <laughs> I heard someone on the radio the other day describe themselves as a, a radical individual. individual. And they were speaking on behalf of uh, um, of immigrants in, in the positive, um, which I, I think we all fall on that same that that 
that side of things. We uh, we believe in the immigrant population. We believe that it's uh, it's necessary and, and very good for this country. Um, but once again, at the end of the day, it's you and something else. And Seth and I grew up with uh, parents that told us, if, if you're going to be a garbage man or if you're going to be a janitor or if you're going to be the president or a lawyer or a, a, a bridge builder or a house builder, you're going to be the best. You're going to be the best one that there is. And so they, they just infused and instilled in us this, this individual confidence. We, had, we didn't grow up. We were, we were on the lower side. If it was middle class, it was the lower um, in, in the financial bracket. And we grew up watching our dad come home in denim and weld burns on him. And we just saw, we, we just, I think a belief in people grew from that. And so that statement is about no matter what happens, even in the good and the bad, I just, I believe in, in people as individuals. And in that, I mean that they do come together and rise well above what anybody could, uh, could bring on. So we're, we're, we love uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You read Dietrich Bonhoeffer and you're like, okay, man can conquer no matter what. You know? And I think that because of that, they come together in positive ways. Good, good will conquer. Um, yeah, that, that, that lyric specifically was never meant for, it didn't even dawn on me that it was gonna apply to, and I, it was about m me, sure. it wasn't about yeah. that. So it was kind of like, and there's several of the songs, Ain't No Man is the same song. It's the same, coming from the same place. Yeah. In fact, they were written similar times. It's just about, we can do it, we can do it. Awesome, well thanks guys. Uh, we'll clear these mics off the side if you guys wanna get your instruments in here, if that's still cool, we'll, yeah. we'll have a little bit of music and uh, I'm gonna go in the back and grab a beer. All right, cool. <laughs> Watch you 
while you undress. But if I get too close, will the magic fade? When I turn you off or away? Now if I pull you in, now would I push you out? Clear 
fairness of morning, the late evening thrills, blurry and gray like the roar. The wheels on the highway above them I soar. I'm in the sweet daughter's eyes. My heart is now ruined for the rest of all time. There's no part of it left to give. There's no part of it left to give. I never lived.